Hello everyone, welcome back. So, let us continue a discussion on uh, dynamic response of an SDOP system excited by um, harmonic force. So, uh, we have uh, mass spring dashpot system and here we have a spring which is connected to a mass and then we have this damper. So, M, K and C these are the components of this SDOP system and we have only 1 degrees of freedom in this case x of t and we also have a forcing function f of t. And if you recall the equation of motion, it is m x double dot plus c x dot plus k x is equal to, in this case we have f naught sin lambda t as the forcing function. So, we have a linear system which is excited by a harmonic force with uh, frequency lambda and then also in this case we have uh, initial conditions at t equal to 0. So, we have displacement and velocity defined at t equal to 0 that is x naught and x naught dot. Now, for this problem we have already solved the complete solution which has two components complementary function and particular integral. In the complementary function, we have the response due to initial conditions which we call also a transient response and because of damping, the transient response dies out as the time progresses. So, we will only have a particular integral uh, which we also call the steady state response after the transient uh, is uh, close to 0 and then we only uh, have the steady state response and in that case also, if we have the driving frequency in this case so which is sinusoid, for that we can also find out the response which is again a sinusoid and we can find out the amplitude of that response and uh, the ratio of that amplitude and the static response is what we call the dynamic amplification and we also define the expression. So, this is 1 minus r square whole square plus twice eta r it has a square root in the denominator. So, that is the expression. Now, if you recall what is the nature of this uh, dynamic amplification. So, on the x axis we have r. What is r? r is the frequency ratio that is lambda divided by omega n. Lambda is the driving frequency and omega n is the natural frequency of the system. Now, on the y axis we have this dynamic amplification and then uh, we define something called resonance when we have r equal to 1 that means the driving frequency matches with the natural frequency of the system. So, in that case what happens? Resonance means if you have damping is 0 then the system response will have a dynamic amplification like this. So, this is for damping eta equal to 0. Now, obviously, when r equal to 1 that is resonance, there the response goes to infinity and that we can easily uh, verify from this expression. If we put r equal to 1 here and damping 0, obviously, the denominator in this expression will be 0 and uh, obviously, the value of dynamic magnification factor dmf will be infinite. This we have already discussed in detail and we also have discussed that if we have a non-zero damping then the system will behave like this. So, in that case there will be maxima. So, here is the maxima. We derive the expression for maxima and also corresponding r. These are all derived in the previous lectures. Obviously, in this case damping not equal to 0 that means we have a finite damping. Even in this case if we are close to or equal to 1 that means we have resonance obviously the dynamic response will be more than the static response. Today we will see how we can use this information to quantify damping. Recall in our previous lectures we uh, 
we discussed a technique called logarithmic decrement technique. Using that technique, we can actually quantify the damping from the time history response uh, that we can measure. So, if you have say a free vibrating body uh, with some finite damping and then uh, if we measure that uh, response by some means and then from that response, we can uh, find out the natural frequency obviously from the time period and damping using logarithmic decrement. Today, we are going to derive the expression how we can use this information to quantify damping. But before that, uh, if you recall, what is the maximum value of the dynamic magnification factor? So, mu max, we derive this if you recall it is 1 by twice eta. So, this expression we are going to use today. Now, obviously, uh, if we have um, the case where we consider a system which is driven by harmonic excitation and having a non-zero damping. That system, what we do? We drive the system using a harmonic excitation. Here, if you see, we can control this driving frequency lambda. So, for every frequency, we can uh, record the steady state response and from that response, we can find out what is the amplitude of that response and from the system property, we already know um, what is the static response. That means, we know the amplitude of the forcing function, which is F naught in this case and we also know the stiffness. So, we can find out what is the static response. So, we have the dynamic response. From that, we can find out the amplitude if you have the steady state response and then we also know static response. If we take the ratio of these two, we will get um, mu that is dynamic magnification factor. Now, if we change this lambda that is the forcing frequency and for every lambda if we repeat that exercise, what we can do? We can develop the plot for dynamic magnification factor. Now, just let us see the expression of dynamic magnification factor and equate that for this uh, particular uh, maximum value and see what happens. So, for that, so let us just quickly redraw the shape once more. So, this is mu and then we have this is the shape. Obviously, uh, this plot we can develop from the experiment and for that we have this maximum value. So, this is mu max. Now, what we have is from this plot, you see if we draw a horizontal line here, then for the same amount of mu, we have two frequencies on the x axis. Right. And then this width is what we call the band width. What is that band width? I repeat once more. If we draw a horizontal line, that means we have the same amount of dynamic magnification and then for that we get two frequencies or for the time being because we have r on the y axis. So, we have r 1 and r 2 and the range between these two values of r 1 and r 2 is what we call bandwidth. Now, imagine we have this point at the peak and then we consider another point this horizontal line we draw at 1 by square root of 2 times mu max. In that case, this is what we call the half power bandwidth point. So, we consider this half power bandwidth point and see what happens. So, we have say x of st that is the static response divided by 
1 minus r square whole square. So, we have the third bracket. So, twice eta r whole square. Then on the right hand side what we have? We have 1 by square root of 2 x of s t and what is the value of uh, maximum dynamic magnification? It is 1 by twice eta. Now, if we solve this expression, what we will get? We can easily tell that we will get the values of r 1 and r 2. Obviously, on either sides, we can cancel this x of s t. So, what we will have is square root of 1 minus r square whole square plus twice eta r whole square, which is equal to square root of 2 times twice eta. Obviously, our next task is to take the square on both side of this equation. So, uh, if we take the square on the left hand side, we have the square root. So, that will vanish and then on the right hand side, we have square root of 2 times twice eta. Now, if we simplify this expression, what we get? We have 1 minus twice r square plus r to the power 4 plus here we have 4 eta square r square and then on the right hand side we have square root of 2 square of that is 2 times 8 eta square. For the simplification gives us 1 minus twice r square plus r to the power 4 and then plus we have in this case 8 r square. So, we have 4 eta square r square. So, minus 8 eta square. Obviously, we have to solve for r square from this equation. So, let us further uh, simplify that. So, what we have is uh, r to the power 4 then minus 2 minus 4 eta square times r square plus 1 minus 8 eta square which is equal to 0. Now, from this expression what we can see r square is equal to minus b. So, it will be 2 minus 4 eta square then plus minus square root of within bracket b square minus 4 ac. So, 2 minus 4 eta square whole square then minus 4 times 1 minus 8 eta square. and then whole divided by 2. So, this equation is basically a quadratic equation on r square and then we can solve for r square. Now, if we simplify, so what we will have if we divide this expression by 2, so 1 minus twice eta square plus minus then it will be 1 by 2 square root within the third bracket we have 4 minus 16 eta square plus 16 to the power 4 minus 4 and plus 32 eta square. Obviously, this 4 will get cancelled and then uh, what you can see is 1 minus twice eta square plus minus 1 by 2 square root of then we have 32 eta square then minus 16. So, this is 16 eta square plus 16 
it has to be power 4. Then we can further simplify it. So, this is equal to 1 minus twice eta square then plus minus obviously we have half outside and then we can take 16 eta square common. So, what we will have if we take that 16 eta square out of the square root. So, we will have 4 eta divided by 2. So, we can write it twice eta and then 1 plus 16 eta square is uh, taken out. So, we have eta square inside. Then obviously, we can further simplify this. This expression if we write uh, the square root as half, then we can expand this part and then we will have 1 plus uh, other higher order terms. Obviously, eta it is less than 1. So, all higher order terms we can neglect. So, effectively what we have 1 minus twice eta square plus minus twice eta. So, that is the solution we get for r square. Now, obviously what will be r? r will be 1 minus twice eta square plus minus twice eta whole to the power half. And if you follow the same logic, if you expand this uh, and then retain the first few terms, what you will get 1, then you will have minus eta square. So, you will have eta square, then plus minus eta. So, that is the solution for our, so what we have. So, this last step, I leave it as an exercise for you. You can also cross verify it. So, what we have now is the expression for r and in this case we have r 1 and r 2. So, what is r 1? r 1 is equal to 1 minus eta square minus eta and then what is r 2? This is 1 minus eta square plus eta. So, these are the two expressions for R1 and R2 which defines the bandwidth. And because we have considered the amplitude in such a way, if we estimate the power, this is corresponding to the half power and hence we call this as half power bandwidth. Now, what we do? If we find out what is R2 minus R1, that is what? If you recall, this is the bandwidth. Now, if I find out what is R2 minus R1, what you get? The first expression. So, we have 1 minus eta square plus eta, then minus 1 plus eta square, then minus minus plus eta. So, obviously, these two will get cancelled. So, effectively, we will be left with twice eta. So, if I rewrite that expression. So, what we have on the right hand side is twice eta. So, it tells us that eta is equal to r 2 minus r 1 by 2. So, that is the estimate of damping what we have from this half power bandwidth method. Now, we can further uh, simplify this expression. So, for that let us uh, delete some part of it and then we will write the expression. So, we know what is R 1 and R 2. What is R? It is the ratio of the forcing frequency and the natural frequency of the system. So, we can write down the expression of R 1 and R 2 and that we will do. In that case, what we will have instead of R 1 and R 2, we can write down this in terms of the two forcing frequencies corresponding to this half power bandwidth. So, that we will do in a minute. 
So, what is R 1? R 1 is equal to lambda 1 divided by omega n and what is R 2? This is nothing but lambda 2 divided by omega n. Obviously, this natural frequency omega n and lambda 1, lambda 2 that we uh, use the unit radian per second. If we change it to say f n natural frequency, then it will be the unit is hertz that we can easily convert in we know this conversion very well. So, what we have damping in this case r 2 minus r 1 by 2 and if we write down the expression for r 2 and r 1. So, what we have lambda 2 minus lambda 1 divided by omega n. Right. So, effectively what we have? We have the expression that is eta is equal to half lambda 2 minus lambda 1 divided by omega n. So, that is the expression. Now, what is this midpoint? Obviously, uh, you can further simplify this expression and you can show that uh, eta will be equal to lambda 2 minus lambda 1 divided by lambda 2 plus lambda 1. This you can uh, easily uh, prove. I leave it again a small exercise for you. Uh, just uh, see what is the midpoint and how you can uh, correlate this midpoint with the two values r 1, r 2 or lambda 1, lambda 2 and then you can easily find out this expression. Very simple, just leave it that uh, for you. Otherwise, what we get uh, is basically the expression for damping which we get from the measurement. So, we have an SDOP system and that we uh, drive using a forcing function which is sinusoid and we can control the frequency of that sinusoid and for every driving frequency we find out what is the amplitude of the response and then of course it is a steady state response and then we divide that amplitude with the static response and then we get this dynamic magnification. So, we can plot this and then from that plot we can find out what is this peak point and then from that peak point we can find out what is the half power bandwidth point corresponding to R 1 and R 2 and the moment we do that we can easily find out the damping present in the system. This is one of the way we measure damping in laboratory. So, if you have an SDOP system, so uh, that SDOP system we drive it using forcing function and then we estimate the amount of damping. And this method is called half power band width technique. So, half power, why half power? Again I repeat, we consider first the maximum value of dam dynamic amplification and then uh, divide that by uh, 1 upon square root of 2 that corresponds to the half power bandwidth points and hence uh, we call this technique as half power bandwidth technique to measure the damping. This is basically an alternate to the logarithmic decrement that we already discussed earlier. In that case, we use the time history response and then from the time history response we try to quantify damping, but in this case what we have? we drive the system using a harmonic excitation and then uh, we find out the dynamic magnification for each driving frequency and from that plot we quantify the amount of damping present in the system. So, this is another way very popular technique. In our next class, we will solve some problem and we will see how we can utilize this to quantify damping. So, with that let us close here and then in our next class, we will continue with examples. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.